when you know <laughs> make sure my volume's off here there we go starting preview starting welcome to the Auburn Medical Group YouTube channel program today with Dr. Gwen and Dr. Mark Vaughn talking about science and hydroxychloroquine science science he believes in science so thank you for joining us <laughs> and this is something we've been well we we teased at it on our Friday evening we did live video right yep we are now that we're at work in the office we're wearing masks and we're <laughs> we're trying to get as far apart on this desk right. as we can because we're in the office but when we're outside we may be a little little different than we are inside so that's why you see us on that Friday video with masks off and not quite this not were we this far apart no we weren't not we quite were closer so thank you all you who touch joined you. us you didn't if let you me really touch wanted you. to don't touch me no touch. No touchy. Uh, the hydroxychloroquine thing. That's ah, just been that is blown all up. over Facebook. Everybody's been hearing it and seeing it right. and has an opinion on it, even though they haven't read the studies. You can still have an opinion. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can still have an opinion. How about that? Uh, so we'd, we'd like to kind of walk you through why you can't be too hard on either side, I, I think. Is I, I think that's probably where we eventually will land. Um, yeah. Okay. But we, we can definitely have some, uh, we can set some ground rules and, and, and some um, guidelines that should be followed um, yeah. based on, on, on what we know thus far. So a lot of this will be based on your blog post from today. Right. Yeah. Which there's a Check link it out. to it in the description, of course. Right. Uh, along with links to a couple of articles. Uh, uh, probably, how many are there? Three, four articles? Um, no, I mean, in, in the YouTube. Oh, in the YouTube, yeah. description, there's a link to yeah. the uh, Henry Ford study. Oh, Yes. Um, is that the only one? The NIH study? Actually, that may be the only one. There's a, a, Okay. A if you want links to all the studies we talked about, head on over to Dr. Green Knight. Got links there um, on the blog for today. Yeah. And then I also put links to the uh, Dr. Vaughn's COVID-19 Updates podcast. Right. Because this kind of material is on there also, the little five-minute weekday. Yep. And this material is constantly evolving. So there will yep. probably be a new update in the future about where we're at with this. Where our so. conclusion may be different than what today's is. Which may be. Based on we more data. on the best data we have available at the be time. <laughs> because, um. because what we say about a particular drug for a particular application is, is based on what we see in the studies that come out, not on how we vote politically. Right. So we've, Apparently that's not the case for a lot of America that yeah. doesn't read medical research anyway. So Right. But they yeah, like to it, post on it Facebook. Somehow has become a political badge or, about or whether sure. or not you like or should use hydroxychloroquine, which it should not. We should just follow the data and see where it takes us. Which may be different if we get some studies that show what we're looking for, which we're looking for something which, particular and we're not seeing it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's suggestions that may be out there. So that's the, and there should be no dogma in science. We should not have any anything yeah. that we put up on um, a pedestal that we we don't challenge. So. Yes, thank you. So that's where we're coming from. Yeah. Uh, this is a live program, so there are people chatting in with their comments and questions, and we may, we yeah. may be responding to them. Of course, we welcome our channel members. Bianca, Laura Bianca Spurs, and Laura. Thank you for Teresa and Teresa. All, yeah, they're good. all with us. Very good. Appreciate huh? it. Thanks, Rust, for Rusty. Up. There. Nope. Uh, no, Rusty. No He'll catch it later, Lindsay hopefully. or Boo Boo Kitty? Nope. All right, all right. So we're looking for you, though, <laughs> if they, in case they watch us after the fact. Yeah. So we should probably start with the... Uh, Where do we start? Well, we know that there's a lot of material on Facebook promoting hydroxychloroquine right. as the treatment, the silver bullet. And actually, there's another silver bullet, too, that I did a podcast. <laughs> that actually calls it that, yeah. So that we don't have to wear masks. We shouldn't be that, wearing that masks part's... because the hydroxychloroquine yeah. will take care of it and we don't have to worry about that. And... Right. So you're referring to that banned video, the censored video. <laughs> censored, put that in quotes. We didn't uh, censor it. That wasn't us. <laughs> no, we didn't do that. Uh, of a we doctor it, from we don't censor it. doctor from Texas stating that uh, she had treated 350 patients. Sister had, Stella. Had amazing results. Uh, nobody died. Um, and she was using it prophylactically, and a lot of it said the prophylactic meaning preventatively um, at certain doses, which I have never heard of before. And 
you don't need to wear a mask. And does hydroxychloroquine also cure the spirit babies? Well, we don't need to go into that part of it. I mean, the... because we're talking about science, right? So, so we don't need to talk. So we're about... not going to refer to her other YouTube videos. Well, there's no need to. to okay. All right. Um, we won't bring and, that And truly, if, if we are true scientists, people can believe what they want, um, but we should follow the data. We don't need to okay. slander them based on what they believe. Okay, so. Dr. Gwaine. <laughs> I've been appropriately reprimanded. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just saying that's the way we should do. So, so it, she she said, talks about what these if they 350. Want a good laugh? Well, go and check it out if you want a good laugh. <laughs> okay, I got um, that in. But but she does uh, talk about these 350 patients. There there are a few problems with that. One is we we don't know this. We're taking her word for it. Um, and she could, she definitely has the ability to publish that data of on those 350 patients, but it's not been done. Um, and if she did, it would be called a case series study. I have a question. Yeah. At this point in COVID-19, how does a single doctor treat how many? 350. 350 between the time this started and now, one doctor has that many cases, has treated them, and has a way to follow them right. to see that they're still doing well. That, I have that a question it, about that. That in itself is pretty impressive. Uh, is, is this a whole team that's doing it? Is this a, yeah. a, a department study? No, she said personally. I believe, I believe she said I have personally treated Anyways. How does she see that many in amount of time? I mean, yeah. you have to have um, so many positives. The positive rate is like... Right. In, in what, one office, 350... 5% of those tested? She, she's a, so she'd have to be testing how many? I think she works in the ER, maybe. But yeah, you would need a lot. <laughs> Anyways, that's that's neither She's here She's a machine yet. if she sees that many patients. Right. That's that's like those guys in uh, Reading that were doing those those procedures on oh, Medicare geez. patients that ended up going to the heart, jail. Yeah. Because, yeah, I just did a heart procedure on a 40-year-old. <laughs> because of how many they were getting done, it was suspicious. Right. That's how I feel about this many if one person was treating that many when we're getting a positive rate about 5% and they get 390 out of that 5% they're Right. I'm just saying the numbers are right. funny. Okay. <laughs> Again, it could be published and then we would know, but we don't. Okay. So so there are some suspicious things there. And um and that would be a case series, which is not the greatest level of um medical evidence that we have. So so when we talk about studies, there is this hierarchy of what we um but utilize uh and and um incorporate into our decision making um, based on the type of study. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? So, so you so talk about case series. Case series is um, following multiple people. It's essentially a narrative of following people who got a treatment and had an outcome. Okay. Um, a case, uh, what's the other one? Case. Um, well, there's case study. If it's study, one which is a single person. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was looking for. Um, if, and then you can move beyond that. Boy, I'm going to forget all my studies. But there is a case control okay. uh, study, which is a retrospective, uh, meaning looking back, um, where you try to match up people who had a certain outcome with some people who um, had a different outcome. So at the um, time you decide to do a study, whoop. you're looking at stuff that's already happened. Right, right. So it Whereas, is going back in time. It's not okay. prospective. It's not looking forward where you have an intervention and you follow that intervention over time. Which would be better. Which is better. Yeah, because then you can control for confounding variables. Okay. So that's um, the kind of studies we're going to be talking about from yes. here forward as far as the better get studies. Back into my uh, The prospective. YouTube. Prospective. Um, and then there are a few other ones. Uh, oh, gosh, we're going to test my knowledge here of, of the different types of studies um, that, that are more retrospective. There is a cross-sectional study, which is just one point in time. Um, you see where people are at and then the different You're talking retrospective going. again. Yep. Something's already happened. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it, that one's typically done through a, um, a uh, like survey or something where you follow people over at a certain point in time. Okay. Um, but anyway, to move up, the, the highest one we have that is a single study would be a randomized, placebo-controlled, blind, double-blinded study. So what do each of those things Go mean? Go read so, so, so there's First three different things. Randomized. Prospective. Prospective. Yeah, sorry. Pro prospective, meaning it's moving because forward in time. We treat a patient and then follow them as they move forward. Because as we found this week, you can randomize after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew. We'll get to that. Right. We'll get to that. So, so uh, prospective, um, randomized, meaning that um, people 
uh, through a random number generator or, or some way that nobody is able to choose is, are, are uh, designated to one of the either sides of the study. The control, like usually typically gets like a placebo, a sugar pill, or the person who gets the actual intervention, hydroxychloroquine. So that's a uh, randomized uh, controlled. We talked about that. You either get the control, a placebo, sugar pill, so um, to compare it against. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, cause there is a placebo effect. Uh, and what was the last thing? Uh, double blinded. Yeah, what's double that blinded about? means nobody knows neither the patient receiving the treatment nor the person giving the treatment knows, um, what, which it is either the control or the hydroxychloroquine. Why do you have to have the person giving it not know if they're given the real thing or not? Because there can be some bias introduced there. Somehow they influence the patient's outcome or they, the way they interpret the yeah. patient's improvement. Exactly. Because they know they got the treatment. Right, yeah. Okay. So you don't even let them know which right. one they're giving. It's only the researchers on the back end who are compiling or yeah. compiling and, and sorting through the data who know which go. Which. So what about the person who gave them the placebo or the drug? They would know which it is. There's a way to take care of that. There is, yeah. So what you do is you have, a like you said, random number generator. Yep. And comes up and you say, oh, you're this one. Oh, here you go. And, and so they don't know what it is. Somebody types in all these numbers, or maybe it's done automatically. This number goes with the hydroxychloroquine. This number goes with the placebo. And then they keep, the, the computer keeps a record of it. But when the patient comes up and they're given a number, they go and they get that number from the refrigerator or the Pixis machine. No way they know when they're given it whether that's uh, placebo or not because it was somebody who typed it into a computer before or actually had the randomized program the computer decided assigned it right so there really is no knowing whether it's the real thing or not if if you use a placebo that there's no way to tell it from the real thing right yeah they have to look the same yeah so yeah. like if which they typically do. if it's a clear liquid you're injecting it needs to be clear liquid if it's a a white round pill it has to be a white round pill right yeah okay. yeah so so that is and even if we go beyond that the highest level of evidence would be a system, systematic review where people take a bunch of these studies which we will talk about that later and and they review them all and and um see what, uh, how much merit they have and kind of um synthesize all the data to come up with a practice recommendation so one popular form of that would be the cochrane reviews yes that that's a good one yeah. often take uh, they call them meta-analyses Analysis of analysis. Yep. Uh, a study of studies. Right. And sometimes they throw some out when they look at them, or they or they weigh them less highly than other ones according to how good the right. study design is. Yeah. So so if we talk about uh, these studies, we can actually have a few examples of these different types of studies um, that that have been. Um, thrust upon us in, in uh, social media and some that you've talked about that we've talked about. So, so one is this Henry Ford study. Um, it is a retrospective, um, oh, what are the words that they use? It is a case control study, right? Case control. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one. So that is one of those, like I said, kind of middle of the road evidence type ones. Now there are a lot of other things that go into a study that we look at uh, to um, kind of see how, how good the study was done, the study design, the, the power, which means how many p patients were enrolled. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on. And so we're trying to keep this as basic as possible because we don't want to nerd out on the uh, statistics here. I and, apologize, and lose, I've already done it too And much. lose half of our audience. <laughs> but any, anyways, uh, so that's case control. And then the NIH actually did one of those randomized, uh, double-blinded, placebo-controlled studies. Prospectively. Prospectively. Uh, funded by the NIH. Uh, so, uh, so we do have some examples, and th these are all with hydroxychloroquine to see how much it would help. So I, I'll toss it to you. How about you talk, talk about the results? So let's talk about these two studies. The Henry Ford study done at the Henry Ford uh, what, what Michigan. Medical School. Yeah, or, yeah uh, up in this the, health system. Around the Detroit, yeah, health system. Yeah. Around Detroit. Th they did a big one, and they had 2,500 participants in the patients. So this is... This is the patients who got the treatment plus the ones that they go back after the fact to get case controls. They didn't do it prospectively. They did it retrospectively. They said, okay, here's our patients that got the treatment. Hmm, let's, let's go find some patients that also had COVID-19 at the same time who, for whatever reason, didn't get the treatment right. and, and use them as a control. Right. So they, they looked at hydroxychloroquine. Uh, they looked at 
uh, not not any of that treatment, just standard treatment. No, they looked at no hydroxychloroquine yep. with azithromycin. Yes. And they looked at azithromycin all by Alone. itself. Yep. Mm -hmm. And their results with the 2,500 patients said that they had a lower mortality, people dying. Less people died with the hydroxychloroquine right. than standard treatment. And it, it was pretty significant. Yeah. It was 13% versus 26%. Yes. I mean, that's significant. And less people died with hydroxychloroquine, or actually more people died with hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin right. than Strange. the hydroxychloroquine Strangely. by itself. So Strangely. you don't want to use the, hydro the uh, azithromycin with the hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, yeah. There, and uh, azithromycin alone was essentially the same as um, no, yeah. no treatment at all. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's not helping. The, the thing that came out looking good was hydroxychloroquine in that study they yep. were sure to get it within, I think, 80% of the patients who got treated got treated within the first 24 hours of their admission to the hospital right. with hydroxychloroquine and 90% within the first 48 hours. And one of the things that came out of this was this thought that we have to get these people treated early, not late. A lot of treatments like the, uh, the steroid treatments that are recommended are recommended for patients when, with yeah. respiratory distress, right. very advanced patients. The thought with the hydroxychloroquine is because of the way it works in the immune response of the patient to COVID-19, there is a magic point after which it's not going to help. You got to get it before is, we reach that point right. to get the benefit. And so and they actually described biochemically what's going on in the inflammatory response right. and the immune response to say what it is that it's doing at that magic time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do we do now? Do we go to the NIH study or do we explain what or should, or should we you find when you dig deep on the Henry Ford study? Let's stick with that study so we don't confuse people. Okay, 2,500. Um, so 2,500 is a lot of people. We dig a little deeper into that data and you find that if you, of that 2,500, um, if we look at the people who just got hydroxychloroquine versus those who got no treatment at all, uh, at all. The standard treatment. A standard treatment, sorry, not no treatment, yeah. um, not hydroxychloroquine. Um, th those who got hydroxychloroquine uh, were much more likely to receive steroids. The current accepted treatment for hydroxy or for COVID. The steroid treatment. 77% versus 36%. Right. Twice as many people in the hydroxychloroquine group got steroids also compared to the people who got standard treatment. So, was it the hydroxychloroquine <laughs> that made a difference in that group? Right. As a group? Or was it the steroids that made a difference in that group? So, how, how did they... So, so, if we look at the actual way the data was reported, they report the data on the 2500. So, that is a little suspicious that they reported that data when we have that confounding factor of the steroid. But, they tried, they did, I guess, not tried, but, but they did try to... Um, remove that variable and they whittled it down to get um, 190 of those who received the hydroxychloroquine and those who did not, who were um, essentially matched up perfectly in a bunch of different areas, including uh, getting steroids or not. So they have this table that shows 190 and 190 that the computer was able to come up with to right. match it against. So that you have the same distribution of sex, Age groups, uh, I believe comorbid conditions. How many went to the ICU? The uh, steroids. Yeah, there were a bunch of different. Um, yeah, to make them really look the same. Yes. And it took our 2,500 yeah. that we started with down to. <laughs> what would that be? 380. 380. <laughs> so that, now that, it's a study of 380. Right. As much smaller power. Truly matched controls. So it wasn't 2,500 with matched controls. It's. 190 and 190. Then we, then we do still see the difference, though, right? Yeah. So they still there uh, still showed... is a difference in favor of treatment of hydroxychloroquine over standard treatment. Right. So they, they, we talk about this hazard ratio. A hazard ratio um, essentially is a ratio that at one means there's no difference between the two. If if you have a lower hazard ratio, that means it's better and you're less likely to die. A higher hazard ratio, you're more likely to die or have the comorbid. <laughs> The bad outcome. And their hazard ratio was this wide. It was wide. And, and it had a statistically significant, significant p-value, but it was, what, two to, 0.2 so, to 0.8? So for Still those of you that one, don't know these statistical wide. terms, what we're saying is 
Sorry. They took what looked <laughs> like a strong study, powerful study, and it came out looking really, really weak. Yeah. As so, far as trying to make any kind of conclusion. Yeah. So we have to compare that against what's the other, the other study. So let, let's. So so there there is our beef with the um, Henry Ford study. I basically maybe. I guess that's what we come out with. Maybe it helps. Uh, we really have to look at it in light of the NIH right. or ORCID trial. Right. So, so then now let's talk about that NIH study. A study funded by the NIH started enrolling patients in April um, and actually was stopped early in June. Uh, and this was a prospective, double-blinded, placebo-controlled um, study. And it was over four hundred patients. Uh, four four hundred and eighty, four hundred ninety, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, they so were trying to get five hundred, but they didn't quite get. So about a hundred more than what we ended up with. with right, Henry Ford. Um, and that one was actually stopped early. Now it has not been peer reviewed or published yet, so we mm. don't have the data we can sift through like not the like the Henry Ford study. We we do know a few things. They did say that the study was safe, which is one of the things that people are talking about. Oh, you know, um, people aren't giving this because there's heart uh, concerns. Which there, there was that retracted study that showed that it was right, dangerous. Right, well, that yeah. was retracted. So we try not to think about that one right. as we're looking at these new studies. Right. And, and so, so it's safe, um, which is good. So this is uh, reassuring on that front. But the study showed no help from hydroxychloroquine. Now we don't know the numbers. Uh, it hasn't been published yet, but so, it was stopped early because of that. So the study was to go all the way until July, but when they started it, they said, okay, there's certain endpoints. So we'll do it till July unless we get, and then what they defined was results that show that hydroxychloroquine is so good that it would be unethical to continue the study and not give it to everybody, or continue the study to the point that it makes hydroxychloroquine look like it's not helping, so clearly not helping, that it would be unethical to continue giving it to people if it's not helping, especially when they didn't know the safety profile yet. Right. And they, they saw that it wasn't helping so much so, so clearly not helping, that they stopped the study. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, we, we looked at it carefully. We were spending some time looking at this, because I oh, raised man. the question. Yes, yeah, that's... 24 or 48 hours. Uh, we, we know that the, the steroids, they give it when people are in bad shape. With the Henry Ford study, they suggest starting it early is the reason that they got better looking results than other studies. This NIH study said that they started it within 48 hours, 48 hours of somebody meeting the study criteria. Right. I'm sorry, they were randomized within 48 hours of, re of meeting study criteria. I don't know right. if that for sure means when they got admitted or not. Right. If they had symptoms and they otherwise met the criteria, when they got admitted, they met the criteria. I think so, yeah. But to be randomized at 48 hours does not mean that you're getting the drug at 40 hours. And, and that definitely was the case for the um, Henry Ford. Right. So maybe there was a difference there. So um, all of this, where where do where do we land? <laughs> um, where do we land? So, uh, what do we need? We well, I, I think I talked about that earlier. That, that the system, systematic review is the best. Um, but I think before we do a systematic review at this point, we need more studies. I'd like to see a study like the NIH study that definitely gets it started within 24 hours. That's what I would like to right. see. I want to read that study. Right. And I guess the big question that people are probably asking is, um, if I get diagnosed with COVID, am I going to be able to get this? <laughs> Do we have an answer? It's, uh, it's not currently on the list of approved medicines. It, it is in, not. In That's our right. hospital system. So um, we wouldn't yeah. be giving it as outpatient because. Yeah, nowhere does it say that it's indicated for preventative or prophylactic treatment. Nobody's so, done so, outpatient studies. So we would never give it to. That are big enough for us to have seen yeah. them. Yeah, to, to you just to prevent it. Yeah. Um, there actually are some. Uh, small, very, very small studies of people who have uh, lupus and other autoimmune diseases who are taking it, who still got COVID. So um, that that may suggest that that 
that likely suggests that there's no preventative action there. Anyway, so it's not, so you should not ask your doctor for that. A doctor probably should not be prescribing it preventatively. And then if you get a very mild case and are outside of the hospital and don't need admission, uh, we see no indication that you would need it there in that case either. Uh, once you go into the hospital, Different, different story. Different you're, story. And, and you're I actually guess affected that is... by the disease enough that you have to go to the hospital. All right. Yeah. If if you're able to live at home and you don't have to be hospitalized, we don't have some big monster that we have to get rid of. Right. Because your body's going to fight it off. Yeah. And, and most cases do that. Yeah. But so. there is that question of starting it early enough. <laughs> so if you do need to hospitalize, do need to be hospitalized, we might do well to get it on early if it turns out that it is helpful like the Henry Ford study suggests. Right. Yeah. Um, now, the, something else that comes up. Oh, Lindsay and Rusty are here, by the way. Oh, one, Lindsay one and Rusty, little, thank little you for shout out. Thanks yes. for showing up. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Another thing that comes up is this question of using zinc with hydroxychloroquine. Mm. Now, this is they, outpatient. Some people, people mention this, yeah. So we talk about zinc, and apparently there's a lot of stuff out there because I have people who are not in the medical profession asking me these questions. In fact, that's today we talked about it on the uh, Dr. Vaughn's COVID-19 updates podcast. Mm -hmm. The the question from Alan was, what about zinc? I've heard that it helps, uh, or that hydroxychloroquine helps zinc get into cells. Is that something that matters here? And indeed, hydroxychloroquine, when studied with zinc in cancer, um, what do they call it? Cancer in vitro studies? Or? In vitro studies with cancer lines. They, oh, yeah, yeah. They, like, yeah, they get a cancer lines, yeah. and they keep the cells growing in a, a research setting so they can see what, what affects it. Well, if you put in hydroxychloroquine and zinc in these cancer cell lines, something about the hydroxychloroquine helps to get the zinc into the cells to kill them, which you want to kill cancer cells. That might be a strategy that's helpful in COVID-19 infected cells because you would shut down the machinery yeah. that's making more virus and let your body do its job to get rid of it more quickly. Unfortunately, this hasn't been studied in people uh, using zinc and hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19. We, we don't know if it does anything for that. We know that there's some suggestion in these cancer cells that it kills cells. Hmm. We don't yeah. know if taking it by mouth is going to get it where it needs to go, if it's going to have the same effect. It, it's worthy of study, though, because right. of the in vitro studies from eight years ago or more hmm. ago. Interesting. Years, yeah. But nothing done on any viral infections. Oh, oh, oh. On... Zinc is an antiviral. Um, yeah, there that's... has been work done on that, and I think it I'm was not... with other coronaviruses. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So absolutely, cold, cold it viruses. is something to look into. Yeah. But we don't have any evidence that helps in this setting. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, let's get to some questions. How about that? Okay. We do have your some questions good. and comments. So uh, we got a lot of uh, interactions here. We appreciate that. We're going to stick to some of our um, channel members, which you can do become one. But uh, Rusty Bernard. Yeah, I'd say at this point, just channel can, members. Can you prescribe off label? Things can be prescribed off label, but the doctor do puts themselves at risk when they do that. Yes. You need to be able to defend what you're doing because. Um, you're kind of going out on your own when you're off label because the FDA, Federal Drug Administration, has certain things that a drug is supposed to be used for that they've studied. So off label treatments that we would use would be using any SSRI antidepressant for anxiety. Sure. Because not all yeah. of them have been studied to show that they're effective and safe for the treatment of anxiety. But we do it because we consider it to be a class effect and it should work. And sometimes the reason we do it with something that doesn't have the indication is because it costs less yeah. or has fewer side effects. And you might say, well, why not just use the stuff that has the, the studies? Well, sometimes generics came out after they started testing these things. And the drug company that used to make it no longer has the patent. So they have no interest in paying for a study for something they can't get anything more than $4 a prescription for. But we have interest in prescribing it to patients uh, who can get it for four dollars or less uh, if it will most likely help their symptoms and you could say that about hydroxychloroquine. hydroxychloroquine i don't know of anybody being told by a state board that they're going to be in trouble for prescribing it for that I have except not heard of, heard for of that. in the sense that if it were to be found to be beneficial for inpatients and it's being used outpatient 
and we're losing the supply, hmm. then there would right. be reason to tell people or to make a moratorium on using it for outpatient purposes. Right. Yeah. But as it is now with the safety that we see, I, I don't think using an inpatient would necessarily be something that a state board would come down on. I don't or, think so. Or, or if there was, it would be state by state. It, it's it not would, clearly it would be across variable, the board yeah. something that they would go after. Yeah. I, I can tell you, I saw a patient of mine today who actually has rheumatoid arthritis and takes um, hydroxychloroquine for that. Uh, she had some difficulty getting her medication uh, a few months ago as a result of the everybody trying to oh. buy it up. So so there, this is not without some um, yeah. uh, consequences if, if we do uh, start treating with it. Yeah, so, so th that's another reason that we're, and there's been other examples of this, like the H1N1 influenza where everybody wanted their prophylactic prescription of, of uh, Tamiflu. antiviral, Tamiflu, yeah. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, you were putting at risk the people who needed an antiviral because they actually had the infection. Yeah. Or, or family members that we would prophylax. If, it were, if we're prescribing it for people just because they ask for it for just in case, we're putting, so at that point, we kind of have to take off our hat for serving the individual patient and put on our public health hat Right. And prescribe it for where it's needed. Yes. Rather yeah. than, and that's kind of an awkward thing to have to do, but we do sometimes have to switch from individual patient's doctor to public health provider. We do it all the time with antibiotics. You know, we, we don't want to promote antibiotic resistance in a whole, so we don't yeah, give the it whole for, for certain yeah. things that we know are, you know, not going to be helped by it. So that kind of a... Yeah. Side because example. that's a people versus bacteria issue rather than right customer satisfaction <laughs> exactly yeah uh, Bianca uh, made a comment about thalidomide um, just saying that that was one thing that had a bad outcome sure did um, yeah yeah when, when pregnant women um, yeah so so it is something and, and she made a comment earlier that that um, uh, science is something that is constantly iterating and improving uh, and well said yeah, so we uh, uh, that's we take that to heart, and and we um, yeah, there are improvements all the time. So um, yeah, it is it is the best we have with the knowledge we have right now. So we that's what we are doing. And anybody who says they know for sure about <laughs> because of a post on Facebook, because of a post on Facebook, um, you, you know, especially about hydroxychloroquine, we can tell you that uh, we sifted through the data, and it is still not a hundred percent clear. Yeah. And we only mentioned a, a couple Some. of studies of, of many yes. that are yep. out there. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, the most landmark studies on the issue, really. So, right. Yeah. Thank so. you, Dr. Wayne. Anybody yeah. want to thank in our great audience? Absolutely. While you're at it, go check out the, the blog today. It goes into a little more depth on a, um, not only that hierarchy we just talked about of studies, but it also talks about the um, chronological uh, order in which we go through studies, going from in vitro all yeah. the way to human studies, which is another way, because there was another post about <laughs> why hydroxychloroquine has to work yeah. based on an old study from 2005. So go check that out, yeah. drgreennight.com. I do want to thank uh, my Patreons, Boo Boo Kitty and Teresa Roat, who, Teresa's here. Hey, thanks for what you do. Appreciate it. Yes. And I'd also like to thank both Boo Boo Kitty and Lindsay Antoine. So until next time. Hey, I'm Dr. Gwen Vaughn. Dr. Mark Vaughn telling you to stay in good health. Yep. Thanks for sticking with us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>